So it's really my pleasure today to introduce you to a personal hero of mine, Penny Newman. I guess I should also start by saying who I am, Brenda Sarathy in the Department of Environmental Analysis. And there's this whole bio of Penny that I just, I don't even want to get into reading. Let me just say I moved to Southern California in 2005. At that time I was living in Riverside, California, and I was doing a postdoc then. I didn't have this fabulous gig as a professor at Pitzer College. And I went to a talk on environmental justice in the inland area. And I first saw Penny give a talk to an undergraduate classroom. And I sat there, first of all, just overwhelmed by what I was learning about a place I was living in and was quite new to. Um, and four or five years later, I am now on the board of uh, this organization that Penny Newman is the executive director of, the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. She comes from, um, she basically was an organic organizer. She grew, um, she became what she is now because she had to fight toxics in her community. So the first Superfund site in California, the Stringfellow Acid Pits, is a stone's throw from Claremont. And I also have the honor and privilege of doing research on that topic. So kind of all, it all came together for me. And we wanted to bring Penny Newman to campus. Many of you are already familiar with her work. Certainly a lot of 5C students and professors have allied with the organization over the years. And she's here now um, at Pitzer's 50th to give a talk on fires, floods, and fossil fuels, social movements for climate justice. So I want to give, a, give it up for Penny Newman and all our co-sponsors. So we got um, the Community Engagement Center at Pitzer College, the Robert Redford Conservancy for Southern California Sustainability, Campus Life Committee, Pomona, College's, P Pomona Co College Public Event Funding, their 5C Environmental Analysis Program, as well as the Public Policy Analysis Program, and Harvey Mudd's College Lead Dean for Environmental Analysis. I want to thank everyone who's participa participated today, who's, who's come out, and I look forward to your participation later this afternoon as well. So without further ado, Penny Newman. I am just really overwhelmed that all of you would come out to hear what I have to say. So I just want to put it out there right away. Thank you, guys. That brought back a lot of uh, memories. And um, one of the things I think our movement is lacking is really um, developing the culture and the music. So if it's OK with you, we'd love to adopt you at CCAEJ and just bring you along with us. Um, I wanted to, to quickly introduce uh, people who are associated with CCAEJ. So if uh, you have questions, or you can target them to do some answers afterward or whatever. So the staff is Graciela Larios, who's our organizing director at the back, back there, and Jean Cayano, who's our associate director and picks up all the stuff that I drop and don't take care of. And she steps in and makes sure it gets done. And uh, Susanna Negretti is one of our organizers in San Bernardino, and Erica Flores was another organizer. Um, is Maggie here? Maggie Hawkins is on our board, and I know she was going to try to be here. And then Brenda Sarathi, who's, who's also on our board. Uh, the other, other thing to know is that the organization is doing a 360 evaluation on me. Um, so they're all taking notes, I'm sure. So please be kind to me and clap a little louder, because it might influence my evaluation. Um, you know, it has been 44 years since Earth, the first Earth Day was held. And that was a recognition that we really needed to step forward and make sure that we took care of Mother Earth, this little blue ball of sphere that we live on. And that the recognition that there needs to be some balance here. Yesterday I had a, a meeting with some old co colleagues of mine in Los Angeles one is now the Director of Environmental Health at, for LA County. The other one is a, an attorney who represents cities and counties in uh, Los Angeles. 
And they worked with us as we were developing some of the, the really groundbreaking toxic um, laws that were put into place, from Superfund to uh, the Tanner Bill to hazmat teams developing that. Uh, to all kinds of things that, that really put in place a way of dealing with toxic chemicals. We developed the Department of Toxic Substance Control out of Department of Health Services so that we had people um, that weren't just disease oriented, but that were looking at the environmental impacts as well and could respond and do testing and intervene and do cleanups. Um, we, were, we were lamenting that after all these years, about 35 years of the three of us working together, that not a lot has changed. That we may have some institutions in place, but we're not rigorously enforcing those laws. And are we any better off than we were 35 years ago? Have we really started to recognize and deal with the problems that we have. And I have to say, in this day and age, and I never thought it would happen, you always think that it can't get worse than it was, and it always surprises you and does, that at least back then, we were recognizing the issues as real. We were arguing about how to solve it, but we were recognizing the issues. We now live in a time and place where Wall Street crashes our economy, we bail them out and the rest of us are left on our own. We now live in a society in which we really believe we can inject toxic chemicals into the earth with, with chemicals that dissolve rock and not expect it to do anything. It's fracking. That we honestly believe that we can build a pipeline to take Canadian dirty oil to Texas to be shipped overseas. And we're not going to destroy, if there is a, a spill, the bread box of the nation. And what happens if we do that? We are a, in a position where we believe there is clean coal, and you actually see people talk about that even though we're doing mountaintop mining and the destruction that happens there. So how do we get to this place where up is down and down is up, much like Alice in Wonderland falling through the rabbit hole? How do we get so that the public discourse totally ignores the facts? And what, what really gets me is that it's not just the Looney Tunes out there who don't believe in, in global warming, because it's snowing. Why would you <laughs> believe it's global? What are you talking about? We have blizzards. The good leaders are following that same trail. Jerry Brown, who wrote and worked with us in putting into place some of these really groundbreaking laws, thinks fracking is just fine that we're in a drought and they're willing to risk the drinking water. How do we get to that and what do we do about it? I have notes over here to make sure that I stay on track because I have a tendency to go off on tangents because there's so much going on. So I'm trying to stick to, to certain things. When we talk about the fires, the floods, and fossil fuels, they're all interconnected. You know, my husband is a fireman, my son is a fireman, and my grandson is training to be a fireman. They know that the fires we're dealing with today are unlike the fires we dealt with 10 years ago. You only have to see Colorado or Texas and all of these places where we've had this massive problem to know that global warming is real. The flooding like we had with Sandy in those storms. That's real. And if we can't come to grips with the fact that we're in a crisis, with all of that evidence around us, we're doomed. Because you can't come to the solutions if you're not even going to recognize 
what the problem is. And I think that's really where we're at. I had the privilege a few years ago of going to Alaska for a conference with Native Alaskans. And I was really struck by their belief in, in explaining how in Mother Earth we are, are designed to work together in a balance. And that it's okay to harvest what's on the surface as long as we don't take too much, just what we need but that when we start extracting from her, her inside, that we start doing damage, that we're removing her vital organs. And during this conference, there was a professor from Berkeley who was there. He'd been working on the Valdez, uh, Exxon Valdez spill. And so he was reporting back to the group about what they were finding. After lunch, we had a panel discussion on organizing. And all of a sudden, this professor is sitting here next to me talking about how to organize communities, which I thought was kind of strange. And then he opened his mouth. <laughs> and I knew it was really strange. He started by saying, well, the first thing you need to do is stick to the facts. All of this nonsense about Mother Earth and how you're killing her by extracting is nonsense. We need to stick with science. And you need to find one person to speak on your behalf. And he should wear a suit and look appropriate. And that he should stick to the scientific facts. And that's it. And I sat there, and the next one to speak, flabbergasted. Um, you just insulted an entire culture and told them that what they believe is foolishness. And I started by apologizing that as a white person, I am devastated that he would say such a thing, but that sometimes we get very Eurocentric and we believe that what our little society, people around us believe is the only belief and that there is no other truth. And I think we're coming to understand that what my friends in the Chickaloon Village were saying is absolutely true. Fossil fuels and the extraction from the earth has done nothing but bring damage to our environment. That includes oil, the um, extraction for gas, um, all of it, coal, all of it. And I thought, that's one of the big problems that we have, is that we get in our mind, this is the only truth, this is the only thing that matters, and we talk to only people who believe that way. We don't open up the discussion to people who may have different perspectives, different opinions, different beliefs, different learned experiences. To the Native Americans, they have survived for eons, knowing their beliefs. Native Americans are now at the forefront of the battle on the Keystone Pipeline because they know from history that this is going to be disastrous and they are the ones who are going to suffer most. You have people of color who are stepping forward across the world to, dem to demand climate justice because they know that when, when the corporations and our government screw up, they are the ones who are going to suffer. And though they don't have money, they don't have influence, they have the courage to stand up and fight back. And they're fighting back not just for them, but for all of us. And I think that's a challenge that we all face. We need to find a way to stand together with all of those other communities who are on the front line, who are trying to survive and fight back against all of those who would have us believe there is no problem. We need to stand up and say there's more of a criteria than just profit. And I think that's where our, our society has, America has really gotten to the point where the beginning and the end of any discussion is how much profit does it bring. And we can talk about that as far as goods movement goes, as far as natural gas goes, 
you know, as we're trying to move toward renewables, solar and wind and all the others, we have the industry seeing the writing on the wall, which is, boy, we're not going to be able to charge a lot for this. We're kind of losing our control of, of, of uh, energy. Um, and so they're in the last throes of fighting back. And that's why we're seeing the fracking. Let's get as much out of that last piece of natural gas that we can, um, no matter what it does to the rest of the population around it. Let's go for it. And they think very big in doing that because they know that when you get into solar, the joy about solar is that you can do it on rooftops. You can do it independently. You're not tied to the utilities. You're not tied to the oil companies. It provides some independence for communities and for individuals. And they lose their profit. So we're really um, in the last big battles when people are feeling desperate, where the oil companies are trying to get the last of the oil that they can extract and the profits uh, all across the board, that's when they really get vicious. And that's when we're seeing. And unfortunately, our elected officials are going along with it. If something doesn't change and doesn't change drastically, if people don't start standing up and saying, this is not right, there is a problem with fracking. There is a problem with um, excavating for natural gas that we need to get off of fossil fuel. We're going to keep having bigger and bigger problems. And it's going to reach a point where we're not going to come back. Now, I quite frankly believe that you don't have to convince people about global warming to make a difference. Global warming is connected with the greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases come from those same operations all across the board. So if we're talking about solving a problem, we can do it on a local level where people can see, taste, and feel what you're talking about instead of some ethereal theory out there about you know, something is warming and it's causing chaos. That's hard for people to get their minds around. And in organizing, we always learn, take it from where people are. So in Southern California, what is the major greenhouse grass, gas source? Anybody? Transportation. Cars, trucks, locomotives. California passed a groundbreaking bill, AB 32, to start addressing that. And we are putting millions into doing that. Reduce the greenhouse gases. Chose a market approach, which I totally disagree with and don't think it's going to get us where we need to go. But at least it's, it, it had the, the um, promise of being able to do something. But at the same time, California is spending millions on infrastructure to expand goods movement. More trucks, more locomotives onto our freeways, into our communities. How in the world can anyone expect to reduce greenhouse gases when you're increasing the source? That's where I think we're schizophrenic. You know, we're not dealing with this in a, in a logical manner or a holistic manner. And we really need to step back and really think of this through a little more carefully. But it shows, I mean, you couldn't ask for someone who thinks big other than Jerry Brown. I mean, he always comes up with these ideas people think are just off the charts. But he's not even dealing with this. And I don't know if old age has, has um, worn him down <laughs> or what. But you know, it's something that we, we need to start dealing with. Jerry Brown thinks it's OK to do fracking, that it's not in conflict with renewables. But if we're going to invest money into natural gas, we're not investing that money into renewables. And once you build a natural gas power plant, 
You're not going to tear it down in two years. You're going to continue to use it. So does it make sense to try to um, go to renewables as fast as we can while you divert on natural gas? So what is at the bottom of all of that is the corporations and the profits for the rich. Do I sound anti-capitalist? <laughs> yeah. So I said that people don't have to believe in global warming to do something. So let me give you an example. In Southern California, in the inland valleys, we have the highest level of particulate pollution in the nation. Mira Loma is the fourth highest in the world after Jakarta, Calcutta, and Bangkok. China's been added to that list as well. We know that children in Mira Loma have the slowest lung growth and the weakest lung capacity. So Mira Loma has now become the warehouse district in the world. I mean, it is the largest warehouse district around. How does that make any sense? So for the people in Mira Loma, greenhouse gases and the co-pollutants that go with goods movement are a reality. They taste it. They see it. They feel it in the health and, and safety of their children. In San Bernardino, we have the BNSF rail yard, Warren Buffett's railroad, that has the highest cancer risk in the state at a whopping 3,300 in a million. 3,300 in a million. Not one in a million, which is EPA's level. 3,300 in a million. The children in, in uh, San Bernardino, we just did, conducted a uh, health study with Loma Linda University. And in the screening of children at the elementary school, we found a 47% asthma rate. 47% asthma rate. So just to give you an idea of what that, what I, what that means, let's have this half of the room over here. Take a deep breath in. Out. Oh, I'm squeaky. In <laughs> and out. Keep doing that. And this half from the green over this way. I want you to put your teeth together and hold your nose and try to breathe. Keep deep breaths, all of you. You get to breathe normally and healthy. Bring in that air. Some more. It's pretty hard, isn't it? You start feeling kind of lightheaded because you can't quite get a full lungful. That's what 47% of the kids in that school are going through. Not be, you can breathe normally. <laughs> That's what they're going through. They're having a really hard time breathing. That whole area, there's 4,000 people in the high cancer risk area that are exposed to this pollution every day, 24 hours a day. You have Marissa, the little girl that we first got introduced to when she was two years old. She's now six, I think. Um, Marissa would come to our meetings with her grandma, and she had one of these Dora the Explorer backpacks on wheels. And so, you know, we thought she has her stuffed animals and toys and books and stuff like all little kids do. And then one night, Marissa opened up her backpack. She has a compressor to be able to fund or deliver her asthma medicine. This little girl is attached to a machine just to be able to breathe. Marissa goes to that school. She has been in school just three months out of the whole year because of her asthma. She has been to the hospital dozens of times this year. We've seen the pollution levels high out in our area uh, over the past few years. And as it's been warm, we see it even more. 
this little girl is not going to make it if things don't change. For her community, seeing Marissa struggle to breathe, it's not some theory on global warming. It's a reality. It is their life or their death. They are literally fighting for their lives. I've often heard people talk about, well, we need to make our own personal choices here. That's the solution. And the personal choices are buy a hybrid, right? And buy those little weird shaped light bulbs. Well, for our leaders who make these suggestions all the time that it's your duty to do this, while they let the corporations go about doing whatever they want. For working class people, that's not their choice. Their personal choices are, do I buy my daughter's asthma medicine or do I put food on the table for the rest of the family? Do I drive my children to school in the old clunker or do I let them walk to school next to, or to 800 trucks that drive by less than five feet from them with their diesel spewing out. That's the choice of most people. We live in two societies now where you have people who are making the decisions totally separate from the people who are living the consequences of those decisions. Our democracy has fallen apart and money has taken over. God, that sounds so depressing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I truly believe that the only hope that we have is for us to be bold, to be courageous, and to step forward in a, one voice to demand that things change. We were just in Sacramento last week meeting with um, elected officials who don't have the slightest idea what's going on. Our statewide coalition, the California Environmental Justice Alliance, just did a scorecard on all the elected officials in, in California. And I can tell you it's not released yet, but nobody got an A. We had just a couple people get Bs. Most of our elected officials got Ds and Fs on environmental justice. They don't have the slightest idea what they're doing. And in many reason, for many reasons, that's our fault. We need to be relaying a very clear message, a message that directs them instead of sitting back waiting for them to make the wrong decisions. So many of us believe that we go to the polls and we vote for somebody and that's the end of our civic duties. And it's not, it's just the beginning. It means we have to step up and have our voice heard. And that's really hard when you're competing against Fox and all the rest of the media that's out there. It's really hard to get that information out. But there is so much at stake right now that hard it just isn't an acceptable answer. We have to dig deep and we have to move forward. The corporations are bold. They put forward wacky ideas that benefit them and none, none of us. But there are people who want to listen if we can just direct them in the right way. In our communities, we've started our civic engagement work where we're trying to connect people who don't vote because they don't see it as having any relevance to them to come to the polls and start voting, to start making their voices heard. And the change in the demographics in, in Southern California are there. We can outnumber them if we can just get people to the polls. San Bernardino just had an election for mayor out of 77,000 people. Was it 6,000 voted? Mm. That's got to change. People need to take that responsibility of stepping forward. 
in, in the United States, we have the right to, hear, to vote. We have a right to have our voices heard. But we also have a responsibility. And that responsibility we haven't been taking seriously. And for many of our families that work two and three jobs at a time, trying to do a little more is really hard. But it really is in self-defense. We don't have a choice here, gang. We're all in this together. And we need to start combining our, our efforts. Each one of us brings talents and skills, lived experience and wisdom. We need to start combining those so that we survive. And I think if we start looking at big picture uh, issues, instead of incremental things, if we do things incrementally, a little change at a time, it's going to take too long for all of these increments to combine enough to make a difference in our communities, to make a difference in Marissa's life. We need to be bold. And that means taking on big fights. We should not have fracking. That is crazy. We should not have the Keystone Pipeline. That is crazy. We should not have fossil fuels. Diesel should be banned. You know, there's, there's some recent research done by Dr. John Freund, and he hasn't published yet, that shows us that the real disease-causing portion of, dis of diesel is not particular, the particulate. It is the vapors and the ultrafines that are small enough they can go through the cell membrane. They can migrate. That's why we see brain tumors, heart disease, uh, birth defects beyond just respiratory from breathing diesel. It's because these particles are going throughout our body. If that is the case, we aren't regulating vapors and ultrafines. We're regulating particles. <clears throat> so no matter how clean your trucks are to make them meet regulations, it's not clean enough. It's the wrong answer. And we are spending millions to convert to clean trucks. And if we're spending those millions, do you think that the agencies can go back to that industry and say, oh, never mind. Now we're going to do something else? No. We're already on that track. And it's going to be extremely difficult to change that uh, trajectory. And you can't blame the industry for being angry about it. But if we don't, we're going to continue to damage people. And we're not doing anything at all to stop that damage, although we think we are. So I really think that we're at the point, like we were with tobacco, where we tried filters, we tried low tar and nicotine, but we came to the conclusion that we need to stop smoking. And it was a huge challenge. Talk about courageous and bold. Try and take somebody's cigarettes from them. So I think we're at that same point. We did it. We were successful in doing that. We had public health on our, on our side. We had attorneys on our side. We had the public understanding, getting the message, and really understanding what the issue was, not saying smoking. What's smoking? You know. So we can do it this way, too. And I think if we do that, we're on our way to trying to solve some of these issues. The AQMD, South Coast AQMD, is really pushing for zero emission logistics. And it doesn't mean going to natural gas. Natural gas puts off NOx and is not helpful, it's methane. So it's, it's not the answer to that. But they're looking at other uh, technology to move us forward. And I think that's what we have to start doing. I understand that here at the college, there is an effort to uh, in divestment of fossil fuels. Is that right? I applaud your work. That is the way to go for it. Go after the money, get people to stop investing in corporations that are involved in fossil fuel. That will move the, the debate further along than anywhere else. For CCAEJ, we're here. We've been here for 35 years. We're not going anywhere. We have to fight. We don't have a choice. 
We welcome any partnerships that we can join together with. Anything that we can do to advance your efforts, we welcome. Anything you can bring to the organization to help advance our efforts, we welcome very strongly. I want to end because I really want us to have a conversation. I want to hear what you have to say to challenge me. I love to argue. Um, to get ideas on other things that we could be doing as well and joining with you to do. Um, I, I would really welcome that. But I want to read just a poem that um, a community member had written for us. Um, she also did a, an art piece on it. And it's called, Thanks for the Sunset. Knowing not the impact of their daily lives, cars and actions constantly move, but no forward progress. The ocean breeze takes it away into the empire enclosed by regal mountains. The waste of the West sets, stagnates, destroys lungs, lifestyle, atmosphere. As the sun gets low, it illuminates. The particles heavy and the gases many. With the view we behold is extraordinary. The silly jurisdictions cannot contain the air they rule. No one can. Do not be fooled. Together as one, we will overcome and, the clean, and clean the air that we all share so tomorrow comes for everyone. You'll have to take a picture, uh, a look at the, the photo on this that she's done. It's true, we have magnificent sunsets, and yet it is that very thing that is destroying us. If we come together, we can find the solutions. I saw it happen before. I know it can happen again. And we welcome any partnerships that we can pull together. Um, Change is coming, but it takes a long time. Thank you. <laughs>